Hi, everybody. Welcome to HRC Online. Let's talk HR. This is our live content events where we take elements that are in the CIPD syllabus and, and bring in a panel of experts to talk about these specific topics and try to get an expert view about how organizations should be approaching certain situations. Today, we've picked the really uh, tricky topic of change. So we've got very little to talk about today. Um, and I am joined by Vic, Joanna and Uma. Vic, how are you today? Are you enjoying the sunshine in, in Norwich? Oh, I'm, I'm loving it. As you can tell with my giant jumper that I have on, I think I've misjudged the weather somewhat. But um, but yeah, it's shining through the window behind me. So it's, it's, it's all good. Uma, once again, late night, Pakistan joining us. Uh, we've had a little bit of sun in the UK, so everyone's overly excited. Um, how, how, uh, how's the weather over in Pakistan? Is it your summer or is it your winter at the moment? <laughs> There's too much too much sun here, so <laughs> take some take some from us. So <laughs> it's hot. <laughs> and Please. Joanna, how are, how are you finding it in? Have you have you started your gardening yet? I have, I have. Always enjoyable. It's uh, sunny, but it's still quite cold, isn't it? It is, yeah. Especially in the mornings when I'm taking the dog out, I'm I'm still putting the the jumper on, and I don't want to. I'm, I'm heating off now. Due to the the electricity prices in the UK, I'm heating off. Yeah, everyone's nodding. Uma's like, "Why do you need heating?" <laughs> <laughs> um, today we're going to talk about change, and we're going to talk about some change models to start with, and, and sort of models for change. And any time I think about change, straight to mind for me comes the Kubler Ross model, where people go through shock, denial, they go through anger bargaining, depression, and then acceptance of change when it's implemented. Joanna, when you think of change models, what, what comes to mind in your head? Do you know what actually comes to mind in my head is that they're all useful and you've just got to choose which seems appropriate for your organisation and the change that you're going through. And you may have to take them with a pinch of salt and make sure that you adapt them to your own situation because there, there's, a, there's a core of truth in any change model, but you can't apply anything rigidly. Makes sense. Yeah, trying to follow anything by the letter of the law is always quite difficult. Um, Uma, when you think of change models, what comes to mind for yourself? Yeah, um, it's, it's pretty... Uh, what I think is that uh, change is is ine inevitable in the organizations and uh, of course the people in the organizations they they, they think that uh, they they want change but they are not uh, ready for the change um, and uh, for that readiness basically they, they need to come out of the shell that they have been uh, doing for past uh, many years or months or uh, uh, and and how the organizations is is performing and uh, um, the the real challenge of change is 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 accepting that it it is in, uh, inevitable and you have to change otherwise the organizations or uh, the people they uh, they would be run over running over you and one thing that i really like uh, really want to emphasize is that it is uh, there are personalities who like change and there are personalities who actually hate change so so we need to look at those personalities within our organizations uh, as to who are really uh, wanting that change and who are resisting that yeah, I, I, there's, a, there's a quote from, well, whether it's an actual quote from Albert Einstein or not is, is remain to be seen, but it's stay away from negative people. They have a problem for every solution. And change often has that effect, doesn't it, where something's put forward and people will just list problem after problem after problem, won't they, Vic? Well, they do. Um, the I'll come in on the, the models first before I go to that one because there's something that I wanted to pick up on with the, the people that come in with that. But with the with the Kubler-Ross change um, curve that you've mentioned, it's a good one, <clears throat> but it's very related to grief, um, which is what the, the, the whole point of it is. So you go through that shock and the denial um, phases of it, which is what people feel a lot of the time when they're going through change and that's why that model is used because something is inevitably taken away 
from the person. Um, and it's shifting something that they've got very, very used to having um, by their side or around them, and suddenly it's taken away. So that's why it's very relatable to the, the grief uh, cycle. But what you then have, um, there's a couple of other models, there's Lewin's, um, the three stages. So you've got the unfreeze, um, which means you're looking at what it is that needs to be changed and taking a look around. Then there's the actual change stage where you amend what it is that you need to do and then you refreeze it. So you go back to um, you, you, your business as usual, but once the change has taken place. So you've got the Lewin stages, but one that I use for change is actually a team dynamics model, which is Tuckman, which I'm sure everybody's heard of. But when you implement change and you're going through these curves, you are throwing the dynamics of a group or a team or a department into turmoil. So you then go through that Tuckman stages of you'll go, you, you're, you're norming and performing as your team, but actually a change happens and bang, you're back to storming at the beginning. So it's it's those elements that can actually, when you're when you're learning and when you're producing um, your, I suppose your your exams and your assessments and things like that. But then when you go into the workplace, you can use those interchangeably with each other and um, those particular models and um, they work quite well it's a little bit like the satire change model and, and the reason i like that one is because it goes late status quo which is everyone getting on with things and it focuses on performance and then resistance comes in and performance goes up and then what the reason i like it is the next stage is chaos because yeah. you know everything gets plunged into chaos and performance has a as a barometer and instead of saying it will go to this it has a bracket, whereas it can go down or it can go up depending on the quality of the change that's implemented by mm. the organization, then integration, then the new status quo. Um, but Vic, people resistant to change, how, how do you approach that conversation when people say, I don't want to change? The, the biggest, um, the, the change management 101, the question that you've always got to ask before you implement change is the what's in it for me. So that's the, the question that if you are leading change, uh, managing change, um, the question that is always going to be asked from individuals is what's in it for me. And if you can sell the benefits of the change, then you're much more likely to get those people on board who are resistant to begin with. And it has to be done up front. So whenever you are creating your project or uh, you know starting off with whatever change you want to make, it's that people element first that needs to be considered and what the benefits are. Then you communicate those. So they know what's coming. They know how long it's going to take, but they know the benefits of what it is that you're going to do. So, for example, it's going to make your um, system navigation easier, less clicks, something like that. It's going to um, combine departments, making the uh, workload more efficient, something more productive that actually allows the, them to do tasks faster, anything like that. But it's the when people are resistant they don't know what's going to benefit them. So it's always what's in it for me to make sure those people who are resistant understand those benefits for them. It's going to be different for different people. So if you're leading a change for a department and then there's a, you know, you're leading a change for a financial advisor, something like that, chief financial officer, their, what their wants are going to be different. So you'd sell the benefits based on your audience. Can I build on that? Yeah. I, I kind of, I, I mean, I really, I agree with you. People need to know what's in it for them. And I really like aspects of the nudge theory. You know, to be able to plant that seed early on for, mm -hmm. for where you're heading and which direction you might want to go in is, is really good um, to do. And actually, you know, in the nudge theory, you do start to talk about, what, what's in it for the person but that whole planting of the seed pointing people in a direction it's not as overwhelming as sharing a vision early on and if you have time to do it it actually does allow time for people to 
go through their emotions because I think mm -hmm. what we often get and what we relate to the Kubler-Ross model are people's initial emotions. And sometimes they just need to express them, but it isn't where they end up if you give them time. Yeah. So uh, I, quite, I quite like, you know, it, that ability to introduce something a little bit more slowly to set it up really well. And I've seen that being done and being done really, really well, where, you know, concepts are introduced gently over a few meetings before you get into the meat of the discussion about the change. Mm. Anuma, often there can either be a vocal pro the change or there can be a very vocal against the change. When you've got a vocal against the change, like who can really sort of put a spanner in the works of trying to implement something, how... How do you sort of change their minds? How do you negotiate with them about what it is? Because if you implement Joanna's theory, yes, you might be able to, to introduce them to it, but you're potentially giving them an opportunity to build up a massive portfolio of evidence to argue against that change and try to stop it. What do you do when people are that negative against it? Yeah, we need to first understand that there is uh, always uh, it's a J curve that uh, that goes on. Uh, the first, whenever you, organizations and individuals must understand that uh, whenever change happens, first the productivity will also go down, and then there will be a, uh, there there are chances that it, there there will be chances if it is followed through professionally and well managed that the, the the productivity will go up again and then we need to understand that all it, it is a bell curve in fact also of of the changed people i mean there are 20 to 30 percent people who who would always be resistant to change and then there will be 20 or 30 percent people who would be always be very willing to change and then there will be about 40 to 60 percent people who are just neutral they are just in between they're they're they just looking at how things are going on so now those who are resistant the the the, the bottom 20 percent we need to be empathizing with them because they do not understand that what change will be bringing for them and we, we need to be sympathetic towards them and might uh, we might get provide a lot of support to them because uh, it's not that they do not want to change it is that they do not understand why to change uh, so so they we need to tell them that this is we, we need to support them we need to communicate with them and then those who are actually very very uh, by personality by um, by by virtue of their being through that drill perhaps in the in their past organization or perhaps in their lives they are very much willing to change now they can be our um, kind of uh, people who are who, who whom we could delegate uh, the change initiative also and they, they, these are the higher 20 percent of the people and those who are in between, there are 40 or 60 percent of the people in the bottom, uh, in in the center of the stage. They could be, we could be selling them all the benefits, and then they would be giving all those uh, pep talks, perhaps to those people who are um, who are resistant to change. And then we make a force within the organization. It's not that just only the HR has to change uh, to sell the change or the leaders of the organizations have to sell the change, but we need to uh, create a, a, a team within the organization of those people who are very much willing to change. And I, um, in one of the other uh, seminars, in fact, we were discussing about the millennial organization, millennial people, and they are, millennial are those people who are, who are very willing to change uh, lots of things. And they can be sourced within the organizations who could be, um, giving us a good support in terms of uh, selling the change to those who are resistant to the, to the change. And I, th I think adoption then becomes critical, doesn't it? You know, when you're trying to embed that change and you're trying to get that organizational improvement, you've got obviously your innovators, the people that are willing, and they, then you try to use as your... Um, brand ambassadors or whatever to try and get that through to get your early majority going. But it's trying to get that tip over, isn't it, to the late majority and get more people involved. And it it can't be done by yourself in HR, can it, Joanna? It, it is about trusting others. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely working through others with with change because you need everybody engaged. And I think one of the keys to success is if you can find a quick win and amongst it and you can get other people to, to embrace that win or talk about it and that often supports you reaching that tipping point uh, and people can actually see the benefits of the change happening and some of the fears that they may have had start to dissipate a little bit. 
always good to find a quick win. And <laughs> uh, um, Vic, with um, with everything that's gone on, you know, we talk about change. Everything's changed, as everyone always says. But to a degree, a lot hasn't. But people might still be feeling that change fatigue of feeling that nothing is constant in their life. They're either at home or now they're starting to go back into the office or they're changing organisations or they've been on furlough and now they're back at work. And the whole life just doesn't feel consistent anymore. How do you help someone that's suffering from change fatigue get positive and get you know ready for another big change? I think that um, organisations haven't quite learned from their mistakes. And I think that that's one of the areas when you were touching there on the quick wins side of things. I think that learning from mistakes is something that isn't communicated enough. So, for example, when people are when organisations are going through huge change, um they might have gone through change for change's sake but they haven't admitted it and actually they've not come through and said well actually we that didn't go as well as we'd expected and so therefore we're not going to do that again and we're not going to do that this way and it's the communication of the and the acknowledgement of the changes that have already happened and being transparent around that being transparent around what it is that has gone wrong um, and also plans for the future, which would stop and, and try and alleviate some of the anxiety and that change fatigue that is continually happening. Um, because it, it's, it's, it's very alien to a lot of management and, and different departments to actually say, do you know what, we really shouldn't have done this, or we really shouldn't have done it this way. Um, and you start to, that, that word trust has been mentioned, you start to build that up. And it is that the change fatigue comes along with a lack of trust as to what are they going to do now? What are they going to do next? What's going to happen here? And again, the, the it not being explained what the benefits are. Um, so th I think there's a lot to learn from, from organizations just admitting that actually, do you know what? We probably shouldn't have done it this way. We hear you. We're listening to you. And then you start to build that trust a little bit more. And, and so often, Uma, we'll, we'll see an organisation, you know, going through potentially some some poor performance and, and you know, directors go, well, just change everything. Not understanding that change is going to have a, an even further negative effect on organisational performance. Mm. How do we communicate effectively that they need to ensure that change is planned appropriately? Because you can't just throw change you know oh we'll change this we'll change that we'll change the other it needs to be planned it needs to be as joanna mentioned earlier you need to probably give people an early warning if you want it to be embedded quickly and, and minimize disruption so when directors like we'll just change it all how should we have that conversation how should we approach that conversation yeah that's that's basically uh, building on what uh, earlier being said that um, i the the idea behind change is that uh, people need to see things happening and people need to see things uh, changing in fact for good for them uh, if there isn't anything that um, uh, just we are changing things for just for the sake of changing or uh, the environment is changing or the businesses are changing and or perhaps the organizational leaders want a new systems to be brought in. But those people in the organization, they need to see something happening within the organization, which is benefiting them. So a, for, for HR, it is essentially important for them to actually put things into action and uh, smaller things whereby people could see that there are smaller things which are being changed and they are benefiting them in the organization. Just for example, I mean, very small things like um, in the, in the, especially since I have worked extensively in the hurtling industry um, and into, and then in the manufacturing also, just putting up um, good food in the organization uh, where the cafeteria is, or perhaps uh, um, giving them good working environment, good illumination within the, within their offices, um, making the heating work properly, 
properly or the air conditioning work properly in the organization, um, taking care of their uniforms and perhaps taking care of their health issues within the organization, taking care of their mental health issues in the organization. People need to see if, if organization is going to change big things uh, in terms of processes or uh, new product line coming up or new system into the organization coming in. Everything is aligned with the performance of the people. And if they are not healthy enough, if they are not taken care of, care, uh, they, they're not been taken care of within the organization, they're not going to support that change. So very small or minute changes in terms of their own livelihood, in terms of their health issues. I mean, their insurances has to be taken care of. Their families have to be taken care of. They should be coming into the office and they should be feeling uh, feeling a pride that this, 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 is the, this is the place that they should be working nine hours uh, in a day and they should be loving to come again on Monday morning which is very hard to come in uh, come into the office but that's 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 basically is the trick that people could uh, and then basically the the engagement service that that should be done uh, prior to uh, getting into that change initiative and uh, during and after after that change initiative also so that engagement service is uh, are the key basically which which help organization to uh, mayor how their change is is transferring to the people into the organization. Now, Joanna, some directors, uh, as we have been together, just love to change things because they don't like to do things the same way again. Um, and you like to try a different approach to, to the same objective as opposed to just that repetition. How how do we check ourselves if you know if we're in leadership positions to ensure that we're not just forcing change upon people because we don't want to do the same thing again? How do we ensure that it's, it's for the benefit of others? I think that's a good, good point. And I think, as Uma said, that it, it comes to engagement with the staff, understanding how they're feeling, understanding what they see as the issues. And, and actually, if you can't really set up a vision for why something needs to change, then you maybe need to ask yourself, should it be changing right now? Should it be changing at this point in time? So I think there's a little bit in there about, about leadership and knowing yourself and knowing um, what's driving you as well as what's driving the organization and driving your people. So I, I think there's a cultural aspect there. And I definitely think speaking from experience, that it's about having people around you who are, who are willing to challenge and you're willing to listen so that if you suggest something that they're, they're feeling not just resistant to, but they don't think it's the right thing, that, that you, you will hear that message. And if I can pick up on some of Uma's points, I also think that... Um, as part of the culture that he was talking about that you set up in the organization. I think there's something about having a failure culture and being a learning organization and, and being prepared to put your hands up and say, this wasn't a great idea. It, it felt like it should be to start with, but it hasn't worked out and that's okay. What are we gonna learn from it? And we're none of us terribly good at, at embracing failures and owning them and turning them into a learning experience and if we can do that i think we start to face into some of the fears that people have about change and and what it will mean for them and then their willingness to give it a go and come out of their comfort zone because they know they're not going to be punished for it they'll be allowed to make a mistake yeah and and that's you know a lot of people are really worried aren't they you make a mistake you'll get known for it you know oh, you failed at this you failed at this um and one of the things you were mentioning before we went live vic was communication's great but there is such a thing as over communication when it comes to implementing change and giving people too much information um do you want to sort of give us a bit of an explanation as to what you meant by over communication yeah there's um there's a big difference between what you want to know and what you need to know when it comes to change in, in organisations. And when you are having the, well, what some people deem as you're having the change done to you, you feel like you want to know absolutely everything. 
and you you kind of feel a sense of entitlement to that information so you'll plague your manager uh, for what's happening now what's happening next and because we were talking before about transparency it's really vital communication good communication vital to making a change successful but if you give too much information at the beginning of what they want to know rather than what they need to know, then that change can go very wrong very, very quickly. Um, and what I'm noticing at the moment with some um, management and leadership training that I'm doing is that there seems to be an overshare happening of information in order to be transparent and in order to gain the trust of the employees. And I've seen a shift from being in the office to being online and working in a, you know, that home remote working environment where it seems to be much more now managers and leaders oversharing information because they're overcompensating for the fact that they're not present in the office and then they're not face to face with the individuals so they're there is as if they're saying you know this is coming this is what's going to happen you can trust me on this let me let me tell you a little bit more let me tell you a little bit more to relieve your anxiety because they're not face to face with them so they're they're struggling with how to communicate effectively remotely and manage change effectively remotely. And that's really hard. But what's happening is the oversharing is happening. And as you, everyone knows here, change changes. So if you go out with information too quickly, too much, and then you have to change that information, you're going to get a lack of trust immediately. So then the next time, and that's when it all starts to go wrong, you've lost your audience, you've lost your people, you have to backpedal, you've got to say something completely different. And the next time you want to implement a change, that's when you're going to get more resistance, because they don't necessarily believe what it is you're saying to them. And it's, it, it, it seems to be coming from a good place, but it's certainly a shift that I've noticed in terms of being able to manage that change properly, remotely. And Uma, do you think that's just about effective communication and knowing what to say? You know, I, I know, Joanna, you've done media training in the past about how not to give away too much. How do you ensure that you give away the right information so that you get the engagement that you're looking for, but not so much information that you scare people, I guess, with what the outcome could be? Yeah, you're... you're yeah, yeah, just to you, <laughs> yeah, um, uh, Well, the internet had gone again then. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, coming towards the communication part, it's 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 a um, I would refer the Cotter's uh, change management model where uh, where the first thing that he that that there is there is uh, creating an urgency uh, within the within the change uh, when, whenever it is happening. Uh, that is good for for certain amount of changes that you have to do, and uh, in that there is a. A communication thirst also comes in and that you need to create an urgency uh, towards a change but then it, it it doesn't always work it it, it works into different uh, organizations it may work into different segments of the same organization perhaps uh, those who are uh, at the at the higher level of hierarchy maybe they might feel that the creating an urgency is good for them but those who are at the lower level of hierarchy who, who, who might uh, fear fear the loss of their perhaps uh, jobs also, they might not be uh, good in terms of uh, having that uh, urgency that is being created. So, so, so in that, I would, um, I would always, I will always think that uh, McKinsey's 7S model is, is something which is, which is more relevant towards creating the whole, whole agenda of change within the organization, whereas um, we, we are creating strategy, we are structuring the organization, we are creating a system, shared values are there, and then the style of work and staff and skills, everything 
everything comes in, into into the uh, um, into the system. And then uh, Lewin's uh, three three stages model that unfreezing and moving and then refreezing again. So these th these uh, McKinsey seven S model is something which 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 if implemented as, within its spirit, that is one of the things which uh, stage by stage take takes you towards that change thing. But the the other thing, another which is which is really we uh, we should emphasize and should know and should tell our leaders also as HR, which I think is an advisory role towards the CEO or the president or the board. Uh, they are an advisor to them also, so they must tell them that it may take time. Change is not something which is going to happen overnight. Even a very small change also. I'm, I've seen the organizations where a simple performance management tool, if it has to be changed, it takes two, three years. I have experienced it myself that it takes about two, three or four years to actually give benefit to what you have changed because people first, they are resisting that new performance appraisal system is not good. But I've seen people after three or four years that they, the same people are taking benefit of that performance appraisal, new performance appraisal system. That happens because it is an yearly or six monthly uh, life cycle of the performance appraisal and it takes time to embed into the organization and then start giving its uh, um, uh, benefit towards the audience. So I think that the communication part is 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 a very tricky part, and we need to handle it uh, as as a whole package, not as an isolated event that is happening into the organization. It has to be taken care of as a complete package within the organization, whereby people should feel that they are taking part of this change initiative. People should feel that they are going to get something out of it of uh, this, and then their own personal lives and perhaps their own livelihoods will not be uh, will will not only be affected but it will be affected properly and progressively within the within this change model yeah and i think uh, it, it's about i think vic you put it what's in it for me earlier but i you know i've seen so many change projects over the years um one of the unsuccessful ones that always burns in my memory is the trying to implement a crm system in, in a previous organization where I worked, where people would go off in their own little mind, little groups, work out what they need, but it wouldn't work for others and it would break for others and it wouldn't be implementable uh, because it didn't have certain characteristics. And, and the whole thing, and I, I, you know, unfortunately, hundreds of thousands of pounds were spent, wasted because it couldn't be implemented across the board that we were trying to achieve because mm -hmm. there just wasn't that communication to understand the core and critical requirements for everyone can sometimes be really sort of damaging to the belief in an organization that something can have a positive effect. But Vic, a little bit more positive. What successful change story can, can you think of? You know, what at what time have the stars aligned and you've just had a brilliant implementation of a change? You know, the 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 dip has been low and then the, the integration's gone quickly. <clears throat> yeah, thanks for that question. No, well, I have got one. Um, and it's actually coming back to the point of the, the culture of the organization and the importance of change being embedded into culture as to the success of what then comes through. Because, and, and as everyone's been saying so far, in terms of making sure that that happens, taking time, things like that with, with individuals. But if you have a particular change culture that's a positive one, where people know that it's coming and know that it happens quite regularly, high-paced, high-change environments, and you've got that particular kind of organisation, then the change tends to move a little bit smoother and a little bit more positively because they know that that is something that's happening. And, and one of the um, companies that I used to work for was a computer gaming company. So when they produced games, they would produce expansions and patches and things like that on the particular games. So they had launches and these had these were very public launches and these were ones that um you know it would go out there everybody had to be ready for it and the change had to take place it was something that that needed to happen but everyone was aware that these changes happen everyone's aware when the expansions were coming out and everyone was excited about it because what's in it for me 
you get a game yourself, you get merchandise, you get all of this bit, bits and pieces, all the excitement of it. Um, but it was bringing the people in who were going to be implementing the change and dealing with the change from a customer perspective that were used to drive the project and to drive the change and to produce the output. So it's that involvement that is really, really important. And with projects, and that's the thing that doesn't get uh, linked, is projects and change together. Project management and change management are completely linked, always have been, always should be. And it's bringing those people in, creating a change plan, creating a communications plan, along with your project, involving those people from the very, very start, and then moving through that change as you go through. And the successful um, implementation of change is when you know it's coming, you know what's in it for you. And regardless of how quickly it goes, how many there are, it's, it's transparent. So those patches, those expansions, those launches always went incredibly smoothly because you had those people on board from the beginning and they were involved. And Joanna, being comfortable with failure, as you mentioned earlier, I will give you the choice of either telling me a successful change story or an unsuccessful change story. Um, so I'll go with a successful change story that was really hard at the time. So um, I'm thinking of a restructure of a failing company that I work for, and it was really struggling, had previously been really successful, had done really well, um, but just, you know, money was going in the wrong direction, nothing it was doing was working, and there needed to be a really radical restructure. And by that, I mean really siding through the people who were there. And that was really hard because it was quite a small company and people had strong friendship groups. It had been quite a family atmosphere and they were having to let go of, of close friends. So going through the change was really difficult and really challenging and challenging for everybody on a daily basis. But coming out of the other side, what it actually did was um, that bit of unfreezing and freeing people up to do things differently. They had to do things differently because we had half the people that we'd had in the first place. So then you've got an immediate reason why everything had to change. We had to really consider what we were doing. We had to change our processes. We had to change our approach. But as in doing that, it allowed people to step up and have a say in the change and actually see it through. And it ultimately did turn the business around. So it was a really successful change experience. But there were some really, really tough bits along the way. And I think when you've been through change, you have to hold on to the end outcome can be worth this. And you have to help people to see that the low moments are potentially just low moments and that they will come out of the end of it. And I think that's quite quite a strong personal learning experience and one that it's well worth sharing with people who are going through a difficult time in change. And Uma. Same for you, a successful change story or an unsuccessful change story, whichever you prefer. Yeah, why should I prefer unsuccessful? But yes, the successful one is there. <laughs> well, this is something which is which is uh, uh, I got through a performance appraisal mechanism in uh, in my one of my previous organizations, um, and the performance appraisal was earlier done uh, very simply. But uh, what uh, we did was that we shifted towards the bell curve. I mean, bell curve is something which is uh, which is very hard to uh, understand by most of the people uh, into the HR fraternity. Also, that uh, there are uh, lots of against uh, fours and against towards the bell curve. But then the organization where um, we started that, um, it took us, as I earlier was saying, that it takes time to implement the new changes. And it actually, there was lots of resistance amongst the um, leaders in the organization. And what happened was the two very basic things that the top management, the president and CEO of the company, they were for this change and they, dr they drove this change. And uh, since I was the head of HR and I was the advisor for them also into all the HR matters, so 
I they they took me uh, as their uh, uh, bullet, and I was firing as as to how the the new new system will work in the organization. Um, and 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 the second important thing is that it takes take, takes time, and people understood that in three years it took us three years actually to uh, we started it for the first year and then second year, and in the third year the company realized that uh, the company has uh, not only achieved its targets the company um, reduced the turnover by about 25 percent the company increased their revenue by 120 percent into the organization and then they, the company also shared lots of bonuses uh, in the third year so um, all of course not attributed to this this one little this one change but lots uh, being put into actually identifying that how the bell curve in the performance management is going to help um, the top uh, performing people into the organization, how we are going to deal with the low performers within the organization. And we actually um, trained those who were into the lower 10% into the organization that uh, they have to come up into the uh, B grade. And, and if they are not going to come there in three months, they have to be, um, they have to leave the organization. And that was a really hard part uh, going through that change. And we had to inject new blood into the organization when we had to say goodbye to those who are, who couldn't prove themselves. So it was a painful change. It took lots of time. But the idea was that uh, um, the top uh, in the organization, they were completely sold to actually doing it. They were committed to to putting that new changed change into the regardless of the fact that if they are going to lose after three years or four years. But that's that's the that's the basic idea that I once guess sold to that new change you have to be completely committed you don't have any ifs and buts into that change if you have that ifs and buts people will not people are not going to buy it. people are not going to buy it and then you have to be completely sold to the idea that yes that is the change that we need into the organization and that's why people also buy it into the organization and i think both joanna and Uma, you may you you you've talked about successful change with unfortunately the loss of staff in organizations and it's worth mentioning that yes hr do get involved quite a lot in 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 you know redundancies restructures performance management but a lot of the time it's for the benefit of the many when these types of situations occur so that you're trying to improve people's working lives by giving them a stronger opportunity stronger business that they can work within and a stronger sort of income and livelihood for for the effort that they're putting in it's not about just the profit the bottom line it's about the people within the organization a lot of the time when we're doing these change that affect people's lives and redundancies and and performance management it's telling people what level they should be performing at helping them get there and if they're not able to get there not penalizing those that are getting there isn't it i think if i i pick up on that James, something I feel really strongly about um, in HR is that you have to treat people with respect when you're taking them out of the business and you have to appreciate how that difficult that is for them and try and do it with as much kindness as you can put into the process. The process itself might be quite harsh. The outcome might be quite harsh, but you can be kind along the way and that can help people and, and actually often when they move on they move on to something that suits them better but they don't know that at the moment that you're having the conversation and you don't know that either so i think kindness really is important and actually on that i've seen done very very well is not just being kind to the people who are through going through that process and leaving but it's who's left behind and it's what you're going to do for, for those people because, again, they've gone through their change curve, their stages of, of grief, things like that. Their environment has completely changed. So it's acknowledging that and not just going, right, OK, well, they've gone now. So let's just move on because we've done this for you. Um, that they're, they're probably not going to see it that way. And again, as you say, it's respect. It's being kind. But what you've left behind, that's what needs the comfort and the focus then um, and, and the time and the effort. Yeah, and they're going to feel a little bit of guilt, aren't they, sometimes? Not, because yeah. they don't have the value that necessarily they do hold. Um, 
in the business. Umar's disappeared. You see, that's what happens when you connect to, to Pakistan Live. Um, sometimes the internet just goes. <laughs> that's change for you. So that's change. <laughs> well, it's all right. We can cope with it. We can cope with it. Um, all right. We're going to finish on a more positive note. Well, hopefully a more positive note. We will see. I have one final question for you before we uh, before we wrap up, which is, and I'm going to start with you, Vic. What do organizations need to change in 2022? Just one recommendation for changes that they need to make. They and only one. I know what you like. <laughs> planning. Plan up front. Any project, any change, any communication, all of your planning up front. Know who's involved. Know what you're going to say. I will stop talking. But plan. Plan your changes. Don't just implement them. Joanna? What do organizations you know, I, need to I do? was actually going to say exactly the same thing as Vic mm. because planning is often the weakness. So I'm going to choose something else. I, I think I will probably say review your processes. It's really easy to let things slide into your processes because something's happened along the way, um, but it isn't necessary anymore. And you need to keep refreshing and looking for simplifications. Um, so I would say always, always have a, a continual improvement process review going. So much, so many people now will have documentation that is out of date, um, yeah. and they will not address it until something goes wrong, and they real, and they either just get away with it, or it really hits them hard. So it's probably a really relevant point that they need to review the processes and documentation and things like that. And Uma, what one thing do organizations need to change in 2022? They, 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 they need to understand that they need to change. That's that's the best thing. Uh, I mean, they, they, there is no escape out of this. I mean, uh, I don't know if Albert Einstein said this or not, but it's a good quote that uh, if you think that the problems that you have created are going to solve with the same mindset that you that created it, you are you are going to fail. So so you need to change that mindset also. So the one thing that the organizations need to need to understand that uh, they need to understand they need to change and change the mindset within the organization. That's the important thing. Uh, all other things are uh, will, will follow suit, but the yeah. mindset has to be changed. Yeah, and I mean, for me, I just think change isn't a quick fix. It doesn't just improve performance in instantaneously. You have to accept the dip that comes along it, which we've all talked about today. So completely agree with, with, with your suggestions. Well, it, it doesn't matter whether I agree or not, really. I'm just hosting the thing. Um, this has been Let's Talk HR talking about change, joined today by Vic, Joanna and Uma. We've talked around change models, change fatigue, poor planning, over-communication, under-communication, successful change stories, unsuccessful change stories, pretty much everything in between when it comes to change. This will be put live on the YouTube immediately if you want to catch up on anything that you've missed. Um, this is part of HRC Online's commitment to dynamic content by creating content that is live, relevant to what's going on at the moment, not just covering the syllabus and taking off what's there at the moment. This is our commitment to the HR industry by making this content live and open source. So regardless of if you're enrolled with us or not, this content is always available for you to watch on demand. Thank you very much for everyone for joining me today. This has been HRC Online. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.